Have you ever met a fictional character who felt so real that you could almost predict their next move? Well, that's what we're going to be working on today is creating characters with purpose, a guide to multi-layered character development. These are characters where you say, I know this character. I understand this character. I can relate to this character. This character feels like a living entity, somebody I have experienced or, or witnessed, and I just, I get it. This character is fully fleshed out on the page. So we're going to uh, really dive into how to develop well-rounded, compelling characters for your story. Why is this important? Well, developing characters, um, it's crucial. You know, it's, it's it's all part of the uh, the process of creating a heartbeat of your narrative. You know, readers connect with the characters in their journeys, making your narrative more engaging and emotionally resonant. Now, uh, uh, the thing is here is a plot is what needs to happen, and story is how it unfolds, specifically through the experiences of your characters. So the more well-rounded your characters are, the more emotionally true they are, and the more their choices make sense to those emotional truths, the greater chance it is for the reader not only to connect to that character because it feels believable, but also because the characters are making believable choices. Because remember, every character has a position. You have to challenge those positions. That's ultimately what happens on the page. That's what creates the tension. That's what creates the conflicts. That's what creates the resolutions. Because how they choose and what they choose is going to lead to their choices and develop their characters on the page. Oh, this character uh, decided to resolve the fight passiv passively. That's a character choice. You have now developed a character because of that choice. They started with passive. They pushed, and it turned into a fight. And therefore, the character still holds themselves to a moral standard. And what they do is they restrain the person attacking them. So they're still maintaining the truth in their emotional response and their position, which is they are a pacifist. But Thomas... What is character development? Ultimately, it involves creating multidimensional characters who evolve over time. This means understanding their wants, history, beliefs, motivations to, you know, basically their positions. Uh, and you challenge those positions so that they ultimately will uh, completely change, somewhat change, or not change at all on that position. And some positions they can maintain consistency through uh, the entire narrative, but to make a compelling character, you do have to waver them on other decisions. Sometimes it changes slightly, sometimes it changes completely. And that's where we start seeing real development. If none of the characters change their positions, they become static characters. That is not a bad thing. You need static characters and or static positions in those characters. But a uh, truly diverse narrative will have movement of those positions. Okay? So before we actually create a character in real life or a character development arc, uh, we're going to go over four quick tips that will help you look at the process uh, when you're practicing and or working on your characters. So whew, whoop, it, it didn't change. Okay. Uh, number one, things they want. You know, the short of it is ultimately that uh, everyone wants something whether it's a win uh, to find or achieve something. They want to win, find, or achieve something, right? So make sure your characters have clear goals that propel their actions and decisions throughout the story. This is, the, this is different than a position, okay? A want is something they, uh, uh, they are going after. You know, they, they want to win the race or they want to find the... Um, the necklace that their mother gave them, or uh, they want to basically uh, get the promotion at work. Okay. These are wants. All right. And that's why the long of it really takes us on more of a inward journey. That's an important word, a uh, collection of words, inward journey. Okay. So every character needs goal goals. They need clear goals that propel them uh, and their actions and decisions throughout the story. These goals could be external, winning a competition or finding a lost treasure, or internal, finding peace or proving their worth, right? Uh, 
The pursuit of these goals creates motivation, which drives the character forward and gives the readers something to root for. Because ultimately, if they're not truly motivated for something, they don't really create a proactive behavior or be have urgency or agency, I should say. Uh, but they also don't have the urgency to complete the thing. Ah, if I get the promotion, I get the promotion. You know what? The treasure idea is interesting, but... Do I really want to go uh, after the national treasure and create a, a movie uh, <clears throat> plot with uh, Nicolas Cage? No, nah, forget it. Right. But ultimately, uh, these goals, you can have short and long term goals. So you could have little goals and big goals. Right. And uh, you have to distinguish between the two. You know, uh, you know, getting through the day without conflict. It might be uh a short goal, whereas a long goal might be avenging a loved one, right? Okay, you could fringe the hell out of your story if you have to. Uh, this layering keeps the character's journey dynamic and flexible, revealing different aspects of their personality as they handle immediate obstacles while working toward a larger objective. Okay. Now, the other thing is about creating conflict, uh, conflicting desires when it comes to their wants. You know, this is where you introduce... <clears throat> conflicting desires to add that complexity to their motivations. For example, a character might want to pr uh, protect a friend, but also pursue, pursue a career opportunity that requires them to move away. So again, a character might be like, I want to be here for my friend, but this great opportunity for work came, but it's going to take me away from them. <clears throat> now, number two, the other thing to keep in mind is a bit of history a bit not a lot of not extensive not 18 books worth of a uh, historical background so you could write your one novel a bit of history and uh, before i go any further let the narrative pull out the history instead of the history dictating the narrative okay that's how you stay on par on point uh the short of it when it comes to a bit of history is you know, give give each character a past that shapes who they are. This backstory doesn't have to be complex, but should inform the character's motivations and behaviors. If you have a scene going back to National Treasures, in the beginning of the movie, he, uh, Nicolas Cage's character, who is a boy at this time, is going through the attic. Uh, is it the boy? It might be the boy or it might be the father, but uh, the grandfather of Nicolas Cage's character uh, enters the uh, attic. And they say something about the uh, the treasure, and now it you you find out that the uh, the history of this family, the Gates family, uh, <clears throat> they have this basic uh, connection to the founding fathers and uh, the Masons and the, you know all this other stuff. And there's a treasure out there that this family knows about and protects, but they have never really found it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a qu quick bit of history. It's not extensive. It's a bit of history, and it creates the overall uh, character motivation of Nicolas Cage's Mr. Gates character, right? Benjamin Gates. Benjamin Gates. The long of it is a character's past often shapes their current worldview, fears, and behaviors. Their upbringing signifies events and relationships contributed to their motivations and actions in the story. For instance, a character who experiences betrayal in the past might be wary of trusting others. More importantly, if we look at the first national treasure, uh, it's all about the Gates' honor. You know, basically everyone thought the Gates were a joke. They laughed them out of the industry. They, you know, they're just they're treasure hunters. You know, by the end of the movie, they prove their weight and their their weight in gold, their worth. Uh, but in the second movie, that honor is challenged. So now we have the history of the first movie plus that bit of history in the beginning of the movie. And you know, you already know that they are treasure hunters, but more or less to, to keep uh, the fabric of the, uh, the, the, the history of, our, uh, of the states um, intact. But at the same time, their honor as a family name is being challenged by the new antagonist. And that motivates uh, Benjamin Gates, uh, Ben, to uh, to do what he has to do to bring right uh, to the family name. Okay, so that's an example of their past influencing their present. Okay, and the other thing is, you know, you could pinpoint key moments in your character's history that directly impact their present motivations or behaviors. This could include a significant victory, a major loss, or a pivotal relationship that altered 
their life. All right. Um, but then you could also have subtle details. You know, you don't have to go into grand detail. Remember, it's it's all about allowing the narrative to pull out the truth, to pull out the history. So the narrative makes uh, consistent sense, but through the character choices. Right. So you don't have to go, you know, months and months and months of creating these histories. Uh, but ultimately, the subtle details are basically not all aspects of a character's background need to be explicitly stated in the narrative. Some details can be hinted at through behavior, dialogue or decisions, creating intrigue and leaving room for the reader to infer. Vague but informative. A great rule to live by. Vague but informative. All right, number three, my favorite thing in the world, positions. I talk about this all the time, right? The short of it, understanding their positions, okay? Every character holds beliefs that define their morals, their spirituality, and ultimately their outlook on life. Clarify these positions so that their choices are consistent and believable. I talk about it all the time when we bring up positions. If a character likes Diet Cherry Pepsi, mm, OK, you don't have to have them ever say it. <clears throat> they just always choose it every time they go to eat, every time they buy a vending machine, whatever. It doesn't have to be every single time. But when it also comes to a choice, it sounds like, do you want a Coca-Cola? Oh, do you have to eat every Pepsi? No, we don't. I'm not really a fan of Coca-Cola. All right. Uh, so uh, no soda brands were affected or hurt in the making of this film. Um so the, those are ways you create the truth of their actions. So you maintain that consistency. If somebody likes the Giants over the Jets, uh, which is how it should be, because who likes the Jets? Uh, you know what I'm saying? All right. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the long of it. All right. Ultimately, when it comes to the long of it, uh, you want to clarify your character's moral compass, basically, by defining what they believe is right and wrong. That becomes a position. This can shape their reactions to situations such as whether they would choose to help or ignore someone in distress. The other thing is their spiritual and cultural outlooks. Consider how their cultural or spiritual background influences the their worldviews. Their worldviews would ultimately become positions are they driven by a sense of duty to their family or community how do they handle situations that can challenge their cultural norms and uh, uh you know another element but again these are just some of the elements that can make up a position but personal positions can be beyond larger ideals characters have smaller personal preferences habits or beliefs that make them unique like a love for a particular sport or a belief in unconventional healing methods. These add layers of realism to their personality. That's right. So if someone's like Reiki is real and another character's like Reiki is not real. Well, now you know what those two characters positions are and you could have a conversation about it. Now, if you're writing, I always suggest uh, to stay away from leaning towards who is right and wrong. However, the character who believes Reiki works can say it's right. And the character that says, Reiki is wrong, uh, is not real, uh, it, uh, can be right as well. But you as a writer to me to uh, reduce the quote unquote preachy element of writing, allow them to have strong stances, but don't allow one or the other to be right. Allow them to be right in their position. They can believe it all they want, but uh, you as a writer should not uh, allow one standpoint to be like you don't want to belittle one of the standpoints because you're not there for that you know uh you can though again you're the writer you're the creator that could be your voice that could be the you're trying to teach the world that reiki is real or reiki is not real like you can do that i'm just saying if you're trying to stay away from a preachy element uh, that's an important little uh, uh, tidbit of something to add to your writing. All right, number number cuatro. Uh, start from within the heart. The short of it. Begin by developing the internal aspects of a character, their emotions, beliefs, goals, then work outward to their lifestyle and physical attributes. This helps ensure that the character's appearance reflects their internal identity and not the other way around. So let's discuss the long of it. You know, emotions and beliefs are uh, 
where you begin by understanding the characters' emotions, their core beliefs, and their goals. Why? Because this creates their positions. Everything we just basically went over. Uh, you know, it's what do they deeply care about? What do they fear, right? These internal aspects shape their behavior and inter interactions throughout the story. Now, motivations and goals are also as important as discussed before. And this is why you want to outline those ideas uh, that allow you to kind of dictate the story and their choices within that story. But more importantly, let's explain why starting from within is a valued uh, perspective of creating characters. All right. If you start with a CEO, okay, a female CEO, a strong female CEO, a strong female CEO who, uh, who, who's, who's always right. A strong female character, a uh, CEO who's always right. And, uh, she is able to solve all problems right now. We haven't created a dimensional character and we started with things first okay and it's the same thing as like if you wanted to start off with the, the characters a bear right well the character will be a bear a bear race a species of bear who have come into being uh, humanoids they're humanoid bear creatures like the concept is interesting right like you could be like all right it's a it's a it's a humanoid bear creature uh, but there's no depth it's it's the cool factor without any cool inward factor um however if you start with a character who has uh, uh been searching their whole life to connect with faith but have never been in the situation that uh, allowed them to uh fully embrace uh, the religion that they were brought up in with their family and in doing so uh, they feel disconnected to it and even though they go through the motions they are empty and this is something that hurts them. They don't want to be empty. They want to embrace their faith, but the, everything they do just falls short. They are also a beast creature, <laughs> humanoid. Like now the beast thing is the cool factor, but there's now story. There's something to explore. There's nothing to explore when they are a beast character. That's why if you write about, let's say a God, Okay, your your main character is a god. Thor, as an example, is a god. He is not interesting as a god, right? If you're like, he's the god of thunder and lightning. But what makes Thor interesting is not that he's super strong and he's uh, invulnerable. These are just things he can do. But they aren't who he is. They aren't the things we relate to as mere mortals. But we relate to... Uh, difficulty in relationships. Re we relate to losing a mother, a brother, or a father. We relate to feeling like everything we've had has been destroyed. We relate. We re we relate to wanting to avenge the ones we love. Okay, if you know, if you see your best friend and your brother murdered by Thanos, the uh, you know, the Mad Titan, and you're like, you oh, will die for that, right? And then what's your whole motivation is to go get the hammer and, uh, you know, the and storm break is going to break some uh, storms. You know what I'm saying? Like, but if you started with a God of thunder and lightning, there's nothing to explore there with the story because you can't relate. No one can relate to that. You cannot relate to omnip not omnipotence. Not that uh, Thor is that way, but um, like I have a character uh, in well, I have many god-like characters and i always try to use them as uh tools opposed or influential to the protagonists that have positions because now we can relate to that but i also if if i took away all the quote-unquote mortals of the world the gods also have their conflicts they have their positions they have their battles even though they're up here with power levels and like some gods can literally create and destroy and blah, 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 right? There's still, I started with emotional values and then I designed the god around those emotional truths or those, um, those motivational desires that some desires are pure of heart and, so, you know, to them and some desires are not to the society, right? So 
that's how you make any idea more interesting and compelling. All right, let's keep going. Before we jump into the uh, walkthrough, uh, if you're enjoying this lesson and want more insight on fine-tuning your writing skills, remember to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Yeah. All right, what do we got here? Boom. Who are they? All right, so this is the who they are element. All right, so let's start with the who they are. All right. Uh, this is all about their wants, desires, positions, everything from about uh, the above tips. Now, again, I'm going to uh, stay away from the thing I uh, I personally uh, despise, which is uh, listing. <laughs> uh, lists. I'm not a fan of lists uh, at all. Uh, however, I don't, uh, I don't deny the fact that lists work for people. I, they don't work for me. They're, they are not my choice. I always find myself falling into, uh, the, well, you know, where, where is it on the list? Right. And then I got to look at all the lists and all their, what's their favorite colors and stuff. It makes it difficult. But when I organize it into a summarized statement, it really helps me, uh, really understand the character uh just on on a, on a more emotional level so if we're trying to figure out their wants or desires and positions i like to kind of work with one thing uh to start and uh ultimately this becomes the through line to a character arc or plot point all right now all all of you who watch this you know that um more importantly before we uh i have the 27 plot point uh, outline. So we're going to end up using that today uh, to show you how I block out a specific uh, through line for the character arc where they, they develop into something. Okay. But before we get into there, like everything, who are they? All right. Let's say, uh, all right, let's say the character is uh, the following. He's uh, uh, uh Josie, Joyce, Joyce. I think that's Joyce, right? Joyce. Uh, is that how you spell Joyce? Joyce. 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 I think that's Joyce. I'm gonna go with that's Joyce. Uh, if it isn't, let me know in the comments below. It's Josie. Josie and the Pussy Cats. All right, it's Josie. All right, Josie. <coughs> Sorry about that. That's what happens when you're sick. Uh, Josie. Um, all right. So let's think about Josie for a second. Josie. Josie. Oh, you know what? Uh, we could do the character thing we said. Josie, uh, Josie grew up in a highly religious, or I should say a healthy and productive uh, uh, in my uh, family, family culture that is highly religious and uh, deeply devoted to their faith and uh, are not uh, uh, aggressive to alternate religions uh, or faiths or faiths uh, but they do uh, dedicate uh, a good portion portion of their um spare time to their faith Josie uh, has a hard time connecting with that faith even though uh, she wants to feel what her family feels. Her disconnection to th her, that faith uh, adds uh, faith and a disconnection to her family, but only for Josie. Uh, but only for Josie, who makes it a bigger deal 
in her head than others see it as her family truly love her. Uh, Josie keeps her lack of uh, divine connection to herself. Josie! Oh, that's, I think that's actually Joyce. All right, so uh, let's see. Truly loves her. All right, so this becomes, all right, one. I can make several of these. I could do another one. I could be like, you know, uh, uh, she thinks, you know what? We're going to put the cat in. She thinks about her cat often and misses, uh, uh, Cause of house uh, tail uh, house kitten, okay. Pulls of house kitten, okay. Um, she has a soft heart for cats and people who love cats. There you go. All right. So that's an, that. That would be another uh, position. That'll be another motivation. That'll be another like. There's there's more in it, but we are only going to focus on this first one when we're working on the outline. Okay. Who's up, Getty? That's that's my two. Look, she's hanging out with me today. Two. Walk past the camera. Good girl. <laughs> okay, back. All right. Um, is a good girl. So, uh, jo Joyce, uh, jo Josie, Josie, and okay. Josie grew up in a healthy and productive family culture that is highly religious and deeply devoted to their faith, and are not aggressive to altern alternate. Re uh, relationships, religions, Re religions, not religious, religions, okay, or faiths, but they do dedicate a good portion of their spare time to their faith. Josie has a hard time connecting with that faith, even though she wants to feel what her family feels. Her disconnection to that faith adds a disconnection to her family, but only for Josie, who makes it a bigger deal in her head than the others see it as her family truly loves her. Josie keeps her lack of divine connection to herself. So that, so right off the bat, by the way, right off the bat, I'm or my brain is already going, well, if this is where she feels. There are only two ways that I think it could go for this, where I go right, by the way, there's probably a million ways, but my brain is already on two ways. Do I want to go with, she ends up where she leaves her disconnect makes her leave because she wants to find faith somewhere else. Or do I make the story about where she eventually finds faith within the within? And that's how the story ends. Or look, a third one just popped in my head. That's the brilliance of creativity. The third one could be where uh, by the end of the story, she the family realizes what her, her their daughter's issue is. Uh, but they obviously accept her because the their position is that they love her unconditionally. Right. And uh, and Josie Josie realizes that she doesn't need to connect to the faith to have a truly deep and committed co uh, relationship with her family. So there's another right. So there's so many different ways you can go with it. But by understanding this position, we're creating something. Now imagine this character was not the main character. Imagine for a second that this was a secondary or tertiary character, all right, where, uh, you know, maybe the best friend, uh, Melissa, or maybe Josie's sister is the main character. But now I understand Josie as a character. And even as a secondary character, this could be a subplot. Or we don't even experiment with this, this uh, through line, this position, this who she is, her motivations. But I now know how to utilize her within the scene. I know how to move her around with her dialogue and her emotions and her behavior. So we may find little bits of this. This might be seeded or revealed slowly or subtly through her behavior with her sister. That's the strength of understanding what is going on with a character just by who are they. Because who you are are the things inside you, your, your passions, your dislikes, your loves. But there's a big difference between going, she likes cats, she uh, loves faith, she doesn't have a connection to faith. Like, there's a big difference between 
just listing out purple's a favorite color, this blah, 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 right? Verse understanding the motivations and positions into a summarized uh, uh, paragraph. I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but this is why it works so well for me because now if I, I go, well, who is Josie? I'm, she's in the scene. I could look at that and go, oh, excellent. The other thing, though, is what if, um, what if she was a secondary character or main character and I did want to explore uh, a character growth because she could be stagnant. She could just be the character that's sort of like the outcast. She's the black sheep, whatever, right? She could be. But I know that if I wanted to grow her, I have to take what I wrote and change it up like I did. There has to be a resolution. There, ha But that resolution could be that she still never feels connection, but her family accepts her. Or she still doesn't feel connection, and she leaves so she could try to find that connection somewhere else. So that's the end of her story is she ends up leaving uh, her family, and the next book will be about her trying to find that faith, right? Or... Um, the book starts off in the ordinary world where we explore that. And then she does leave her family and the book takes place away from her family and away from these people. Well, she discovers, she tries to discover a faith. Maybe she does outside the world or whatever the case is. Maybe she ends up back home. Look, see, you can just, the brain just keeps going because of just understanding the position and knowing the position, motivations and desires and all these things. Just knowing that allows you to start going, well, where does that go and what is my end goal? What, how am I trying to change that position? Because I know as a storyteller, as a creative, I have to change a position somehow. That, you know, it's like the hero's journey. They start off as the farm boy or the farm girl. And, uh, you know, let's say they lose their, their mother and father and somebody, a mentor comes and joins, says, hey, uh, you can do magic, you know, and then they're like, oh, well, uh, I've always wanted to see the world, says Luke Skywalker, but I'm stuck on this farm. And then like all these crazy things happen and now I have to go. But do I? No, I can't. I can't leave. I have to help my aunt and uncle. You know, this the season is just going to start. <laughs> You know, the denial, you know, the resistance to the adventure. And then they're like, I'm going to go because each of his positions are being challenged. He wants to go and be a part of the fleet, you know, the the, the resistance or whatever, or, uh, you know, the, the, the whatever. He wants to leave. Luke wants to leave, but he loves his uncle and aunt because they help raise him and protect him. So he wants to help them. And so he's like, you know, all right, fine. His challenge, his position was challenged. I want to leave. You know, I think, you know, I, I can, uh, you know, if I work it out, I could go next year. And the uncle's like, eh, maybe, maybe let's push it back one more season. Uh, you know, you help me. And he's like, all right, I, you know, and so his position slightly changed because he still wants to go, but he's, he, he's not in the mind where he's like, I have to go now. Right. He's like, I want to go, but because you need me here, I don't have to go. I can wait a year. And now he's like the farm. And think about this. That emotional truth moves with him once he meets Obi-Wan Kenobi before he sees that his aunts and uncles are, are dead or or past. Uh, Obi-Wan says, you know, I should train you. And, you know, there's things I have to go see. I got to go save the princess or whatever the case may be. And uh, he goes. I can't, I can't leave. I can't go. I my, I need to help my, because his position had changed slightly enough where he was dedicated to his parent, his, his aunt and uncle now to help on the farm. But what happens when he sees that the, the stormtroopers took everything away? His position is completely changed because he knows there's nothing left here. And now more than ever, he's like, you know what? This empire needs somebody. We got to save this princess because uh, if she has information that could help stop the empire, I'm in. And you could keep doing that throughout the story. You just keep putting them, you keep challenging their positions and that creates flow, ebb and flow of movement. With that said, let's go into what they are. What they are... So right now, this is where I'd figure out their faith, but because we uh, try not to use real world faiths and we can stay, uh, uh, you know, we can keep the bias out of it, right? So let's say they, uh, she is a, a seeker of the moon light goddess. Uh, uh, Dula, Dula. All right. 
She is a seeker of the moonlight goddess Dula. That's what they are. She's a seeker of the... Which, uh, if we're going to explain, this is a person in training to become a... Uh, instead of a seeker, they become a conduit of the moonlight goddess Dula. All right. So uh, now, by the way, we just created. Oh, wait, you're not seeing the screen. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry about that. All right. So let's get it. What are they? So what are they? Uh, she is a seeker of the moonlight goddess Dula. And then, of course, what is that? This is a person in training to become a conduit of moonlight goddess Dula. Now, we just did a couple things here. We just did world building while trying to understand who. Uh, I. This is the first time I'm working on it. And this is what I mean when it's it's good to have like a bit of history, but it's better to allow the history to develop through the narrative needs. And you could explore and grow from there. Uh, you know, obviously, if I was going to take this to the next level and I really I really was going to put some time into it, I would do if I wrote this sentence out, I would spend a little bit more time outside of the narrative to figure out who doula is and what worship is of doula uh, doula would uh, necessarily do. And maybe I could kind of like expand on that, but just as a brainstorming exercise that we're doing right now, this is what I mean. Like we just created world building. We created the, you know, the design of what she is. She's, I know this is a person in training. A seeker is now a someone in training, but a conduit is, probably like a priest or a cleric or whatever, you know, a, a rabbi or something. They're, they're the higher ups, right? They're the next level. Right. Um, so now just, just as a, just as an exercise, imagine I started with this. All right. I'm going to write a story about a seeker of the moonlight. God as a doula, right? Again, that's not interesting. What does that even mean? What is her goals? All we know is that she's a seeker, which if we're basing it off the world building that has been created, she's just somebody who's studying to become the god, uh, a conduit, because seekers are in training to become uh, conduits, right? So there's no real story there. There's just plot. The plot is she is a seeker, which means that she's training to become a conduit, which means her goal is to become a conduit. Now, this does a couple of things for us when it comes to story building we just figured out uh who who they are and now we're working on what they are and this could also change the way we look at the story because now we can isolate it in the church she still has all those feelings that have that make up who she is but now we can stay the story within the church and it's the train it's the school of the church it's the process now we get to watch her go through the process to become a conduit does she become a conduit? Does she not become a conduit? And we could still add those other elements. Does her family still respect her and love her if she can't become a conduit because she doesn't feel faith? Right? So each element helps us develop the story because we're not on the story yet. We're just wondering about a character. And we started internally and then we went externally. And the externally helps us develop the environment and helps us develop the plot but we understand the motivations behind it. Okay. All right. Bing, 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 bing. Okay. Why they are. Okay. Why they are. Well, why they are would be uh, where we basically try to understand their role. I mean, uh, what, what is their role within the story, right? What is their role within the story? Well, here is where we say to ourselves, they are the main character or the prote or the sub character. They could even be an antagonist, believe it or not. But let's say they, uh, Josie is the main character or the main protagonist. Main, pro actually, she's a character, and the story is through her as the protagonist uh why they are okay uh why they are all right and again uh if we think about uh how we're going to utilize them in this story 
this is where we could start thinking about the uh, deeper elements, why they are, right? So it's like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to uh, uh, showcase the value of faith and a loving family. All right. Uh, Josie was brought up with good intentions and a family that wanted to see their children become more than just another person yet to the parents that has nothing to do with what they end up as uh no uh, that they has nothing to do with with things but that their kids are good people uh, who uh, do what they love and love what they do uh, in a way that inspires, inspires, inspires others, right? So that's a pretty, uh, <clears throat> what you might call it? That's a pretty, uh, pretty healthy environment. So why they are, you know, <clears throat> everything is explaining uh, these elements, okay? Which brings us to a character arc, okay? So let's, uh, let's, let's just, just real quick. Okay. Why did he write D? Because I needed to make the numbers. Okay. So now we're going to talk about character arc, uh, the story, uh, the character story plot or character arc, okay? So the first thing, uh, we kind of brought this up here, who they are, right? So we have to think about, I want to, uh, their journey to becoming a conduit. There you go. That's going to be their first uh, character arc, okay? But this is going to be fueled by their motivations, which is uh, center this around her deeper emotional truths and uh, and ultimately her positions right now i know what this is because that's up here that's this thing right okay all right and i might call this uh let's call this uh seeker because i like to i like to label my arcs all right so seeker to come do it uh and obviously they are sometimes right right on the no nose because uh ultimately wait, what color do I, orange right? ultimately uh i want to be able to look at it and know what it is i'm talking about like i don't want to have to think and be like did i what is this one about all right and then uh the second one we came up with the cat thing right so uh so this one's going to be, let's just call this uh, uh, her cat. Okay, her cat. Now, obviously, this would become a subplot, right? Because it's uh, secondary. And uh, her emotional journey of accepting the loss of her cat and how uh okay yeah there we go that's, that's all i need for that all right and then maybe maybe there's a third one right so maybe the third one is um uh let's see let's see oh we can we can actually add a third one based so we know that this is her journey to uh becoming a conduit but remember the other element was she feels disconnected to her family uh you know herself they, they don't, you know, like she's thinking, oh, because I can't connect to my faith, my family's not going to love me. Like that's her battle, right? So uh, family bonds, right? So that's ultimately what it is. And then uh, again, you know, uh, uh, she thinks because her connection to faith is not there that her family will not love her all right so that's three uh three full-on plot points that we created 
And I could create more, by the way. I could just keep going. I could, now I could I maybe have she has a sister or a brother or whatever. Maybe there's a thing there. Like I could go deeper and deeper. And obviously, uh, okay. Do, 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 do. All right. So this is for Joyce. Josie. All right. Uh, ignore the fact that I can't read. Uh, <laughs> so this is Josie. Uh, she has three uh, characters. Now, that brings us to we the outline. Let's do this. Okay, this is still the character plot and character arc. So we're going to focus on this one. Uh, Seeker to uh, Conduit. Okay. Oh, wait. I, I don't want to put anything there. But let's do... Uh, now, as you can see, these are chapters, but what I'm going to do... All right, just so you understand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on what should go in that plot point of the uh, of the outline. I'm not going to worry about where it goes in chapters because, again, if you've watched the uh, Sagora series uh, playlist uh, or even just the outlining series playlist, and so you'll know that um, the chapters come later. And as I build up those plot points, then I have to figure out what goes where and how much goes where. And do I break it up into multiple chapters? How many chapters does a plot point have is just based on the information that's needed for that existence. But for now, we're just going to focus on uh, just outlining only the seeker to conduit. And we're going to ignore chapters. So we're not even on chapters. And what I'm doing here specifically is I'm just adding it here so I don't have to do it every single time. Uh, but I'm only going to go to the end of uh, Act 1. So as you can see, this is Act 2. All right. Boop. Uh, the potential is not really needed. But uh, there should actually be uh, this. This should be here. All right. And then if we go back up, it might actually say potential there too, right? Yeah, potential. So this should be a uh, boop. Okay. All right. So there you go. So now the seeker. So how are we going to do this? We're going to say uh, maybe the ordinary world is uh, maybe uh, Josie is being uh, what is it? Anoint anointed. Anointed, anoint. I think that's it. Uh, no, 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 no. Anointed, anoint, uh, anoint, anointed. Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Ceremony, yeah, okay, okay. Specifically, uh, divine or holy office, okay. So uh, Josie's being anointed as a seeker. So what does that mean? That means I'm starting the store, the ordinary world off with her being a seeker. Okay, she's just she's officially in the program. Jo Joyce is being anointed as a seeker. Uh, uh, I will have to explain what a seeker is as well as her and goal, uh, which is to become a conduit. Now, remember, this is um, this is plot, so I'm not worried about story. Remember, a narrative is made up of both plot and story. Plot is what needs to happen, no matter what, and story is how it unfolds through the experiences of the characters. So keep that in mind, okay? Um, all right, moving on. Now, ultimately, the fun part is uh, taking what we have and just keep it going, right? So, you know, now we have to the inciting incident. So Josie is being anointed as a seeker. I will have to explain what a seeker is as well, right? And so, so again, like this is just uh, setting up the rules and foundations of the ordinary world, right? So the inciting incident, since uh, we know that she has the issue with... Um, uh, connecting with faith, right? We can have, uh, this could be where Josie is praying, uh, with her group and, uh, they are in the middle of a 
divine ceremony i can't spell spelling is without me okay uh a divine uh ceremony and while in the middle of it she realizes that it feels weird it's around and everyone is deeply involved in their prayer and she feels like uh she's she's having an out of body experience and looking down at how they all uh and looking down at it all all right so there you go um so uh just just to bear in mind you know uh i would continue to do this for the entire plot point this is not uh, i guess i guess we should uh so this is not designed to be the main plot per se uh this is just the character's arc so if you look at what i'm doing i'm still making a arc to a plot you know like the main plot would have its own arcs around this but if she was a secondary character this would still hold true these plot points will still hold true within the story now the fun part is even if i map out all 27 plot points which i don't have to if it's a subplot but i can it doesn't mean that these things actually have to be visible on the screen on, on the page but they do have to be referenced either emotionally or whatever the case is. So as an example, let's say she has this moment, right? I can, I can, uh, when, when I get to this area, the inciting incident, uh, and let's say her sister is the main character. Um, her sister could be here too. And her sister be could be having a really great moment. And then uh, at the end of it, her sister stands up and looks over at Josie, who's, who is, uh, her behavior has changed to represent at least this as a feeling. And then slowly but surely, maybe we discover that. Maybe the reaction to that is Josie speaks with her sister about how she felt during the ceremony, right? So now this could be a subplot or a main plot and that's the genius about writing out plot is that we're not focused on the story yet we're not focused on how it unfolds we just know that these things have to happen and i can if i really really wanted to by the time i finish plotting out all of the character arcs within the outline i could determine which has a stronger presence on the page where i want to go do i want to do a pov maybe I'll do the POV of Josie here, but now in this, let's say this is its own chapter, I can have the POV of Josie's sister. So before we even get into the story element or chapters, by mapping out the character's arc of what they're going to experience and how they come to terms with whatever it is they're dealing with, um, I can see that uh, in beats, you know, so that's that's the real big advantage um so basically that's what i would do and i would just keep mapping that out so we uh we did three we did three plot points we did uh the ordinary world which uh, we set it up that we're starting with josie is being anointed as a seeker and then i would have to explain what a seeker is and also what her end goal is and again i could do this from uh josie's sister's point of view josie's sister can be the main protagonist if i wanted to and it's just that maybe joey's they're both becoming uh seekers and you know we're experiencing josie becoming a seeker through uh her sister's pov and then again if we went down here this would be the inciting incident which is where she realizes she's not truly connected and again this could either be through her pov or we could go through the sister's pov so that's the fun part is nothing is solid uh nothing is written in stone as they say uh but at least we're understanding the character's movement through uh the narrative itself okay with that said as always i like to ask a question 
Uh, what is a character trait that you think defines your favorite fictional character and why? Let me know in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please like, share, uh, and comment below while subscribing and hitting the bell icon so you don't miss out. Uh, final thoughts. Let's do it. Characters are at the core of any compelling story. Their desires, beliefs, and growth arcs serve as the emotional anchors that draw readers in and keep them engaged. By crafting relatable and multidimensional characters, you create a story that resonates <clears throat> resonates with readers on a personal level. A character's development is more than just a series of traits or well-defined backstory. It involves creating layers of depth and complexity that influence their actions, dialogues, and relationships. Focus on internal aspects like their values, fears, and motivations, and see how this interplay with their external uh, persona to create a more nuanced character. For example, with Josie, we know where her stance is. She wants to become a seeker. She wants to embrace her religious uh, culture. She wants to feel closer to her family through faith. But she doesn't. That's the challenge. She's being challenged not to. She can't. She doesn't know what's going on. So her journey has to be to discover that or accept that, right? Or whatever. It could be a billion things. Um, so a challenge doesn't have to necessarily be like, oh, your faith is stupid. Like, it doesn't have to be that. The challenge can be strictly uh, internal with her. She is having an internal conflict, an inter internal challenge to that position, which is this is something she really wants but she's not able to do it. And the truth is, while characters should have consistent values and motivations that guide their behavior, they should also be flexible enough to react to changes in their environment and relationships. As they encounter challenges, let their choices reflect their core beliefs while allowing them to evolve, revealing new facets of their personality. You know, characters are not separate from the plot. They influence and are influenced by the story elements so a narrative is plot and story plot is what needs to happen but through the story we get to see how they are influenced how they react it's their experience to the plot okay and this uh you know you want to ensure their decisions actively shape the narrative whether it's di uh, driving the story or the narrative forward through their actions or bringing new insights through their reflections now each character should should have unique voices that are shaped by their beliefs experiences and world views this voice from the character should be evident not only in their dialogue but also in how they approach problems Int uh, you know you want to interact uh, you know Characters have a very specific way of talking. They have a specific way of not talking as well. So when and, when and where they speak is important, but how they approach their problems or interact with others and even make decisions are all based on these character uh, traits and elements that start from internal uh, avenues. Now, uh, <clears throat> when you're developing a distinct voice, this will help your character stand out and feel authentic when you start with the emotional truth within which is motivations, beliefs, positions, etc. Don't be afraid to experiment with your characters, by the way. Challenge their beliefs and confront them with moral dilemmas and place them in unfamiliar situations. By stretching their boundaries, you can uncover new aspects of their personalities that add richness to their stories. Additionally, I'd like to say that by doing that, by pushing them to their limits and challenging their motivations, their beliefs, their positions, more importantly, uh, on the page, it might lead you to where you don't want to go with the narrative. And you know what? You just erase and try again. But the idea is that you start learning more about your characters. And you might discover something that you didn't know. And then you go, hmm, I kind of want to explore this. I liked how this character reacted to these moments. All right. Next video in the series, character archetypes using tropes as a springboard, not a crutch. So we're going to play with familiar types of tropes uh, and try to give them fresh perspectives. So you can take things that you like, like, uh, you know, the hero or whatever the case, the best friend or whatever the case may be. And uh, and take it from there and say, all right, these are tropes for a reason. We love these tropes. But how do we put a fresh spin on those tropes? 
All right. So, uh, as always, peace and harmony, truth in action, and uh, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Love you, bye.